After three long years of numerous phases and breaking limitations, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time released on November 21st, 1998 to great acclaim, a large array of Game of the Year awards, numerous 10 out of 10 scores to achieve the highest scored game of all times on GameRankings.com and its successor site, Metacritic. To this date, let alone, it became the best-selling Zelda game yet, a title it would hold for years. However, the story of Ocarina of Time wasn't over. Deep within the offices of Nintendo EAD, a project was being developed to take this revolutionary game and expand even further upon it using the Nintendo 64 add-on, the 64 Disk Drive. However, this expansion kept being pushed further and further back, until it was quietly cancelled upon the end of the Nintendo 64's life. But eventually, it found life on the GameCube in the form of The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time Master Quest. But many felt this wasn't the promised expansion they were told about. What happened? Well today on a special episode of Cut Content, we shall explore that very question by exploring the history and unused content of Ura Zelda. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell too to further support us and keep creating new videos. To many, the story of Ura Zelda is thought to start closer to the end of Ocarina of Time's development. But the story of Ura Zelda cannot be told without Zelda 64's history with the Nintendo 64 disk drive. Therefore, we need to start at the very forefront of Zelda 64's development in 1995 at the Nintendo Shoshinkai event. The Shoshinkai 1995 event was the first big reveal of the Nintendo 64, its accessories and its games. Games that were shown included the ever-anticipated Super Mario 64, Star Fox, Kirby Bowl, and much more. However, one additional peripheral was announced at this very event, titled the 64 Disk Drive, or 64DD for short. This was a large add-on that would be equipped to the expansion port on the bottom of the Nintendo 64 and would enable the N64 to have numerous amount of features. These included everything from an OS that would let you go on both the internet and have a real-time clock. The clock enabled games to even have passage of time when one wasn't playing the game. But the main feature was, of course, that it took in a magnetic disc that held 64 megabytes of storage. While it was nowhere near the PlayStation 700 megabyte disc, the regular N64 cartridge held only around a small 4 megabytes of data. So this was a substantial upgrade. At the same time, the Nintendo 64's expansion pack was required to be used with this machine too, meaning the Nintendo 64's RAM this way would also jump from 4 megabytes to 8 megabytes. And so the one killer app the Nintendo announced for the 64 disk drive at the 1995 Shoshinkai was Zelda 64. This was to be one of the many games announced to have the freedom to utilize the full power of the 8 megabytes of RAM and 64 megabytes of space as needed. And so Zelda 64's development started and continued with these limitations in mind. With 8 megabytes of RAM, they were able to make large environments with huge draw distances. With 64 megabytes of space, and thus having 16 times more space than the average N64 cart at the time, a rather large game could be made to make the world of Hyrule feel truly alive. In fact, the 64 disk drive's internal clock could even be utilized to put a real-time day and night cycle for the game. Ambitions were so high that they wanted to fully utilize the 64 disk drive's power to have a persistent world where any action Link made would stick around for the whole game, whether it be a smashed bot, a footstep in the sand, or a hole made in the ground. However, there was one major problem the team faced, and it was the read speed of the magnetic disks. For anyone who was playing a PlayStation during that era of gaming, load times were a commonality as the disadvantage of using discs was that mechanical parts would need to move and read the disc in order to load areas one was entering. As such, the 64DD using discs here had this very problem. In fact, Yoshiaki Koizumi, which many of you nowadays may know him best as the man who serves the face of Nintendo Direct, served as the 3D system director, game designer, character designer, and event designer. Basically the person in charge of making sure the game looked and runs well. 
he felt the game would not properly function on the 64 disk drive. To quote, My link won't work on the 64 DD. So on March 7th, 1997, after a year and a half of development, Nintendo announced that Zelda 64 was now moving onto a regular Nintendo 64 cartridge. Koizumi further has gone on to say, Consequently, when it was decided that Ocarina of Time would be released on a ROM cartridge instead of the 64DD, there might have been a few people who were disappointed, but I think the happiest guy in the world was probably me. <laughs> and so game development had to bring the scope of the game down. More smaller maps became common. Pre-rendered backgrounds were commonly used and features such as the live clock and persistent world were gone. In exchange, the Nintendo 64 cartridge was able to read every area lightning quick without breaking immersion with a loading screen. However, the good news was that by that point, cartridge sizes for the Nintendo 64 had expanded to 32 megabytes. So despite having the downsize, it kept its overall design and featured a truly live and large world for the time. And so Ocarina of Time was released for the Nintendo 64 after a year and a half of development on a regular Nintendo 64 in 1998. But the story of the 64 disk drive and Zelda was far from over. During the final stretch of Ocarina of Time's development, on May 26, 1998, in an interview with IGN, Shigeru Miyamoto revealed that they were working on a 64DD version of Ocarina of Time called Ura Zelda. Ura in this case translates to another, or flip side. If one was to interpret this title, it can mean that it's a different take on Ocarina of Time. The way this was to work was that one would plug their Ocarina of Time cart into the Nintendo 64, while also plugging Ura Zelda into the 64 disk drive at the same time. With this, the 64 disk drive would expand upon the base cart with new information and data for an expanded experience. This was the direction they were going as development was not to stop on Ocarina of Time. That was to the point where if one even hacks a retail copy of Ocarina of Time, one can enable a disk file in the normal save data file menu. If one had Ura Zelda plugged into their disk drive, they could load into a disk save file, a feature that stayed unused. For anyone who is following Zelda 64's development closely, this news could have been fantastic as it could potentially mean that the game could see a return to some of those old ideas that never got used, including bigger maps, a real-time clock, and an overall larger game. In fact, Miyamoto in the next Ura Zelda interview in February of 1999 stated how he wanted to reincorporate several cut ideas that he couldn't get in due to time and other factors. While Miyamoto never went into direct specifics of what would be an Ura Zelda, his interviews did say one thing very consistently, and it was that it would have new dungeons and that it would be playable after beating the main game. This was clearly the main focus of Miyamoto and how he envisioned it. Other ideas were thrown out in various interviews throughout 1999, including extra challenges, new maps and scenarios, new locations for treasures, and the possibility of them even using the 64DD's network technology. While at the same time, Miyamoto made it clear that this was to feature the same storyline as Ocarina of Time. Taking this all in, it sounded a lot like what we see in many modern games, a DLC pack with an expanded campaign. In this case, new dungeons, maps, scenarios, challenges, and more sprinkled throughout the vanilla game, basically making the ultimate Ocarina of Time experience. However, time passed, and the game just wasn't coming out. Many were scratching their heads on this expansion and theorized it was quietly cancelled as talks had stopped for a year at that point. But on August 25th, 2000, Shigeru Miyamoto revealed that Ur Zelda had been completed for some time by then. As to why it wasn't being released, that wasn't answered. However, to anyone following the 64DD's release to the market, by that point it was well known that it was a commercial failure. The peripheral had launched on December 13, 1999 in Japan after being delayed for 3 years and cost a whopping 299 US dollars, more expensive than the Nintendo 64 itself. On top of that, if one wanted to use its internet capabilities, you had to pay a subscription fee of 2350 US dollars to Rannet per month. Therefore, to just own this entire bundle, 
one would be looking to pay over 500 US dollars. This price isn't even including Ocarina of Time and Ura Zelda's purchase. Therefore, it only sold a little over 15,000 units in Japan and stayed exclusive to Japan as such. It was looking very likely that Ura Zelda, despite being completed, was just not being released cause it wouldn't make its money back with only 15,000 people at absolute most being available to buy it. For many, this was the end of Ura Zelda. Until 2002. The year is 2002. The world was getting ready for an upcoming release of The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. However, Nintendo had a surprise. If one pre-ordered The Wind Waker, they would receive a free bonus of not just the GameCube port of Ocarina of Time, but the first ever release of Ura Zelda, the title of which was being localized as Master Quest in the West. As such, The Wind Waker became the most pre-ordered game to that point, with 500,000 pre-orders. And so Ura Zelda, or now called Master Quest, was out. And it wasn't what people were expecting. What people saw was the exact same Ocarina of Time, except this time the dungeons were remixed, and with a steeper difficulty too. Many questioned what had happened to the new dungeons, maps, scenarios, challenges, and more. Miyamoto, of course, in a December 4th, 2002 interview, mentioned that nothing was cut from Ura Zelda in this port, and in fact, it didn't use any of the 64DD special features in the first place. Were remix dungeons all that Ura Zelda was supposed to be? Well, back in 1999, Miyamoto had even mentioned that they might even do a cartridge special edition of Ura Zelda instead in the end. This, in this case, now became the GameCube disc known as Master Quest. Many felt Miyamoto had lied to them as Master Quest contradicted his interviews, but when one compares those interviews to Master Quest, it all actually technically was delivered. Miyamoto stated new dungeons and maps, which technically those remix ones can be seen as new dungeons and maps. New challenges? Those dungeons were also made to be more difficult too. Rearrangements of treasures? The remix dungeons do just that, with the dungeon items relocated. All while delivering the same exact story of Ocarina of Time as Miyamoto has stated back then. Nintendo had indeed delivered everything it had promised. Ura Zelda was just this. And normally this is where I would end it, but fast forwarding to a whopping 17 years to 2020, we enter the infamous Giga Leak. In August of 2020, a leak came out known as the Giga Leak, which gave us a look at numerous beta developments of games including Super Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time. But one special folder existed called Z underscore Ocarina 2. And yes, this was separate from the Majora's Mask folder for those who are wondering. Within this very folder, numerous maps existed, many of which had two special characters next to each of their names. DD. Yes, we finally had a real leak of Ura Zelda. While we have some of the beta versions of the remixed Master Quest dungeons here, which also further confirms that Master Quest was Ura Zelda, we did also find some maps that we never saw in Master Quest. And so, the plot is about to thicken. The first set of maps are these small compilations of dungeon maps, cut down to only have the entrance that leads to the mini-boss and then to the boss fight. And this exists for every dungeon of the game, except the Ice Cavern and the Gerudo Training Ground. For example, in Dodongo's Cavern, you start at the entrance, but then in the next map is the area where you fight the Lizalfo mini-bosses. And then the next map leads straight to King Dodongo. As well, before certain boss fights, such as Twin Rova, the dungeon item's treasure chest is available right before entering the boss door in order to get the item needed to defeat that very boss. So then, what is the purpose of these very cut-down boss dungeons? And I believe this may have been a boss rush mode where you beat every mini-boss and boss back to back before being teleported to the following dungeon to do the same. This boss rush mode did technically make a return in Ocarina of Time 3D, except cut down even further to just the bosses. No mini-bosses and no traversing cut down dungeons this time. The treasure chest now instead appeared at the end of the boss fight, except two appeared now where one would give you a useful item to beat the next boss and the other wouldn't. 
But back to the Giga Leak, while a boss rush mode was found under Ura Zelda, and already showing that Ura Zelda may indeed have been more than just remix dungeons, two other maps were found that, in my opinion, shakes the entire foundation of what Ura Zelda actually was. And these two maps are actually two maps that we see in Majora's Mask. The first of which is the Swamp Spider House. The exact map that would appear in Majora's Mask was found here. A bet an early version since it lacked anything beyond the map itself. Every room is here actually. The other map, however, is Beneath the Well in Ikana Canyon. Much like the other, it's an early version of the map with some textures even glitching out. But the map is fully built. So what does this all mean? Was Miyamoto really lying considering all this was made for Ura Zelda? The answer is complicated, but to actually answer it, we need to go back all the way to February 1, 1999, the birth of Zelda Gaiden. When Miyamoto and the team were ready to develop the ultimate version of Ocarina of Time, the obvious person to master all of this would be Eiji Onuma, the person who had geniusly designed the dungeons of Ocarina of Time. Yes, even the Water Temple. And of course, many of you may know him better as the director of several of the newer Zelda games. However, to Onuma, this wasn't something he was thrilled about, and rather wished to work on a new Zelda game instead. Having approached Miyamoto about this, Miyamoto decided to give Onuma a challenge. Onuma would be given his very own team and allowed to utilize the existing Ocarina of Time engine to make a new Zelda game. In just one year. While at the same time, the rest of the team would continue working on Ura Zelda. To any developer of the next major game in a popular series, one year of game development time is a nightmare. And so development began on what was to be considered a side story to Ocarina of Time, thus dubbed as Zelda Gaiden. Much like the original Zelda 64, however, this new Zelda game was going to be developed on the 64 disk drive, and was to fully utilize all its features including an internal clock that would have Link trying to prevent the destruction of a strange new world in only one week. Eventually, however, while in mid-development, Zelda Gaiden, much like Ocarina of Time, was now converted into a cartridge-based game as confirmed on September 22, 1999. No reason was given, and this was all three months prior to the 64 disk drive's launch too. Therefore, it might have been once again loading times that were the worry. However, unlike back then, Zelda Gaiden was going to use the expansion pack meaning it would indeed be an evolution with larger areas and greater draw distances, utilizing 8 megabytes of RAM. But the development was indeed slow, with only 20% of the game completed by September of 1999, and still a half a year of that Miyamoto challenge left. At this point is where we may get our answer for what happened to Ura Zelda. Ura Zelda, as we witnessed, indeed had other areas being built for it, as seen within the Giga League areas that appeared in Majora's Mask. While no Nintendo staff has ever confirmed this, all of this, the cut Majora's Mask maps, the concurrent development of Zelda Gaiden, and amazingly making a full Zelda game in only a year, would point to the fact that Zelda Gaiden, which later got renamed to Majora's Mask, eventually started taking assets from Ura Zelda. Therefore, the Swamp Spider House and the Beneath the Well and Iconic Canyon areas may have just been two areas of so much more that was taken and added to Majora's Mask. We don't know the extent of these, but it's even possible that dungeons may have been a part of Ura Zelda 2 that were pulled for this. And so, with a ton of the new resources ripped from Ura Zelda in order to meet the Majora's Mask deadline, while also now shrinking the game down from a week to three days, Ura Zelda was left with only these remix dungeons that we saw in Master Quest. As for the boss rush mode since that appeared in neither games, that might have been cut because either they just didn't like it, or the original assets that triggered the mode were taken into Majora's Mask 2. Thus that August 25th 2008 where Miyamoto dropped that bombshell that Ura Zelda was completed, and that December 4th 2002 date of when Miyamoto said that nothing was cut from Ura Zelda when coming to the GameCube were its lies, as the remix dungeons were all that was left. Ura Zelda was only a husk of what it was supposed to be, and that may have been considered as good enough and complete in the eyes of Nintendo. Now before we wrap this video, 
it is only fitting now to look at the leftovers that were found within the released version of Ura Zelda, known now as Master Quest. Now unlike the base game Ocarina of Time, it doesn't have very much. The first of which is this neat logo titled Legend of Zelda X. Colored in purple and featuring an X, it may have been an internal name for Ura Zelda at the time. The other elements however are from the Giga Leak, which had beta versions of the first three dungeons of Master Quest. Now there are a lot of little changes in these, like the placement of torches or an extra bomb here and there. So I'll cover the more interesting and major ones. Starting with the inside of the Great Deku Tree, more gravestones were put around actually for certain puzzles. Such as here, where if Link pulls it, a chest drops that has 5 rupees in it, while in the release game, the chest is already there. Another being in this area with the keys, where instead of a switch in the middle, a gravestone was there and had to be pulled to activate. Or the area just below the main level with the water, that normally has its switch on the land, but in the beta, it was underwater for an extra Master Quest challenge. Though Dongo's Cavern is mostly just small rearrangements here and there, but there is one rather neat puzzle actually. In the final game, there is a torch to the left back of the room, but originally there was a blue switch which needed an Armos to stand on it. The Armos in this case was on top of this bridge, in place of where the switch is in the final game actually. One is required to push and pull the Armos off the bridge and onto the switch to activate it. And lastly, with Jabu Jabu's belly, the entrance is a whole dose of crazy, filled with random stones to Song of Time blocks with larger stones on top of them. Also, note the lack of cows that existed in the released version. While many may not be happy with the conclusion of what happened to Ura Zelda, one however may find solace in that they actually may have already played Ura Zelda. If you played both Majora's Mask and Master Quest, you may have already played the whole Ura Zelda experience. From the original Ocarina of Time story, new maps of Majora's Mask, remixed and new dungeons of both Master Quest and Majora's Mask, and so much more. And so, with Ura Zelda's legacy absorbed, the masterpiece known as The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask released on April 27, 2000. Eiji Onuma had indeed met his one year challenge and made one of the greatest Zelda games, if not one of the greatest games of all time. A game that we can officially graduate to after having completed this 11 month long Zelda 64 cut content series. As such, hit the subscribe button for our plan to be back with more Zelda and other games cut content too. Hit the like button and comment below on if you would have preferred to have had the completed Ura Zelda instead of Majora's Mask being made. So everyone, thank you for watching!